Hello guys, welcome to the respiratory lecture that I am uh, giving in replacement of the face-to-face -face lecture. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe um, the anatomy and physiology of um, the respiratory system, but specifically as it pertains to childhood uh, respiratory illnesses and conditions. Um, you should be able to contrast injuries um, in infants and children that can affect the respiratory system. Um, you should be able to explain um, lung sounds uh, and visual uh, abnormalities that you could see related to the respiratory system, including the respiratory effort made by the child. You should be able to analyze the need for oxygen supplementation um, or any other kind of uh, nursing intervention pertaining to the respiratory system in children and distinguish between upper respiratory uh, infections or problems and lower respiratory um, problems in children. You should be able to create a nursing care plan for a child with an acute or a chronic respiratory condition, a virus injury, whatever it may be. Um, you should be able to develop a school-based nursing education or other parental teaching related to a hospitalized child or community care situation. And you should be able to perform a full respiratory uh, and, and oxygenation assessment on a child. Pediatric differences that we're really concerned about from um, adults uh, are that um, ch child's, uh, children's respiratory illness risk is higher than for adults. So um, as some of you parents already know, children um, get sick. If there's anything going around in their school, they get it and they bring it home. And that's because their um, immunity is lower than an adult would be. And also because of hygiene issues, maybe they don't wash their hands as much as they should, um, and they touch lots of, lots of surfaces and they touch their mouth. Um, so also, um, children have smaller airways. So the smaller the child is, the more narrow their airways are, which means that they're more prone to have respiratory difficulties if they have mucus or any other kind of um, inflammation in the respiratory system. There's more likely to be an obstruction. Uh, they have less alveolar surface area, so when oxygen exchange happens, um, it's generally enough for them, but if they're sick, it's not. So they can rapidly decline. And um, children are also, the younger they are, the more they breathe with their diaphragm. Um, they have a flexible chest. So you'll see when kids breathe in and out, their uh, cartilage and also their bone, bone seems to retract more than it would on an adult. Adults' uh, chest wall is stiffer, so when they're having breathing difficulties, you don't see as much of a retraction. And that's important because that means they have to work harder to get that breath in because the wall is not stiff, so it's working against them as they're trying to get that full deep breath. Usually that chest wall starts to stiffen with age, so um, think as they're getting up into middle uh, school middle school age and um, adolescence, it's becoming stiffer. Um, so really the highest risk is in the children that are um, in school age and lower. Um, also, the, the size of the structures in the airway, the branches, um, the bronchiolar uh, branches, they also grow and distance um, themselves from each other with age. And so that is protective. Um, as they get bigger, the internal diameter of the airways gets bigger and that protects them from getting as sick um, as they would have when they were smaller. Also, um, immature if infant respiratory and neurological systems, um, they don't have as efficient a response to um, 
hypoxia. So those chemoreceptors that detect uh, hypoxia in the blood um, that adults have, they're less uh, good at responding to hypoxia by causing um, you know, the job of those receptors is to make you breathe faster, to compensate, for example, if you have hypoxia. So in small children, those are less developed um, drives, and so they don't compensate as well when there's hypoxia. I like to show this uh, slide because uh, from your textbook it shows the difference in size um, and in particular what I would point your attention to in this slide would be the size of the child's um, trachea um, just below the glottis and epiglottis. Um, you can see how much narrow it is than an, old, uh, an adolescent or adult child and so that makes them particularly prone to choking hazards for example or epiglottitis which is something that occurs when there's a lot of swelling in that area of the throat. I like to show this slide a lot because you can see that um, just how small the uh, carina is, the, the descending airway, the branches here, they're very small but they're also very high up whereas you can see in an older child the bifurcation of the airway is much lower. So this can mean that um, there's less um, there's less distance for the air to, to go to get into the lungs, um, but that can be e more easier, easily blocked because of the distance being shortened. And this one really shows the difference between the internal diameter um, and uh, you know of a child and an older person so this smallest one here is uh, two millimeters and this would be the size of internal diameter of a trachea say in a in a, a small infant maybe even a premature infant and this is really why we can't resuscitate children that are less than say uh, 22 weeks um, at, at birth because that airway is so small we cannot get any oxygen into those lungs. Um, remember that the, the fetus is generally getting oxygen from the placenta not from breathing in and out. So the diameter here is so small that if they are born premature, um, younger than 22 weeks gestation, we can't even intubate. And um, But as we get older, closer to birth, the newborns is four millimeters here, and that's still very, very small. And you can see how that could easily become blocked by the barest minimum amount of um, mucus in there. Um, as kids get older, um, it, it gets larger and all the way, here we get all the way to 20 millimeters of an adult so um, so that's much easier to breathe through. We've also looked at retractions in our early assessment class um, but retractions just to look at it again you'll need to know that the names of these places so um, the name of the retraction is um, how you describe where you're seeing the retractions. So if a child's retracting, I just don't wanna say they're retracting. I wanna say that they have subcostal, uh, substernal, intercostal retractions. And I just describe, or if they have supraclavicular or sub supersternal uh, retractions, we wanna be really good about using the right language to describe where we're seeing those retractions. So, and this could be a testable item. So one of the most common pathologies you'll see in children um, admitted to the hospital, there's, there's several, but uh, one of them is foreign body aspiration. And um, this is because small children, as you know, are always putting things in their mouth. And then because of that tiny little airway, um, almost anything that they put in their mouth is high risk for them um, choking on it. So uh, that can lead to respiratory failure, of course, um, which, uh, leads to hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and um, the only way to treat that is a tracheostomy. So uh, you, what you would have to do is, is place a tracheostomy below the blocked area, um, and then I, they could go in and try to remove the blockage after the fact. But um, generally when, when you're choking, if it's lodged in there really well, um, 
they they would have to establish uh, 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 the tracheostomy before they could go in and do any surgery because they only have minutes to live if they don't get that airway open. Now, if the blockage goes lower than the place where they would normally do a tracheostomy, then there's nothing they can do to help that child. Um, and it, it generally has a negative outcome associated with that. In kids, because respiratory distress uh, can lead to respiratory failure so quickly, it's vitally important that pediatric nurses and student nurses are able to recognize the signs of respiratory distress uh, quickly um, and intervene early. So mild uh, respiratory distress looks like there's tachypnea, tachycardia, and diaphoresis. Moderate uh, respiratory distress, you have flaring, retractions, grunting and wheezing, anxiety, irritability, mood changes, and headaches and hypertension. And the child, when they're in moderate uh, respiratory distress, they're already in some pretty significant tr trouble. And we don't want them to get to severe because then um, we re really waited too long to um, recognize the situation. We would much rather catch it here at moderate. So as you remember from uh, our assessment class at the beginning of the semester, um, signs of severe respiratory distress involve um, dyspnea, bradycardia, stupor, coma, and um, cyanosis is a very late sign. So the thing that students miss the most on tests is they don't look at the question closely enough if it says uh, select early signs or if it says select late signs. So please make, make sure you pay attention to that distinction on the test. So interventions you can take on a, a client, a patient when they're in respiratory distress Oxygenation, so you don't necessarily need a doctor's order to put oxygen on a patient. Um, it, you know, it's one of those that's inside your nursing um, practice. You do have to let the doctor know, though, and then they will hopefully write an order or they'll tell you to take it off. Uh, you can position the patient, and that's usually uh, one of the first things that you would try doing if it's positioning. Um, fluid bolus often helps because um, as you increase the circulating blood volume, um, it can, it can uh, raise the amount of oxygenation to the brain, for example, and that can be helpful. Um, but it doesn't increase oxygen uh, carrying capacity. Um, and then medications. So uh, oftentimes we'll call a respiratory therapist or if they have um, their own bronchodilator uh, in the ER, the nurses often administer the bronchodilator themselves. So uh, make sure you review the um, effects and, and the proper technique for administering um, bronchodilators uh, and also the inhaled corticosteroids. Um, so, and also the use of spacers and all that. So I know you already know that from fundamentals, but you'll wanna re-go go through it again, just to make sure you remember. Now, new, newborns often have a thing called uh, an apparent life-threatening event. And this is what happens when the baby's asleep in bed and for some reason they get deeply enough asleep that they don't remember to breathe in. Um, the brain, parts of your brain that control that are uh, sometimes not developed in newborns, especially if they're premature at all, but sometimes um, it just happens spontaneously um, and the child doesn't breathe. And so what happens is the parent is alerted. Hopefully they walk in and they see that the baby's not breathing. They stimulate the baby and then the baby breathes. Um, and then they bring the child into the hospital for monitoring. So what will happen is um, the child will be admitted for an overnight stay to see if it happens again. Um, and sometimes they can correct it by, um, if it happens more than once, they can administer small amounts of caffeine to the child to help them not be that deeply asleep. 
Um, it's not the same though as SIDS. Um, you don't want to get that confused with SIDS. Um, although that is another uh, reason that kids are brought into the uh, emergency room. Um, kids can also have obstructive sleep apnea, which in the adult population, you're used to seeing that associated with obesity. So children um, are more and more obese than they used to be. So you do see sleep apnea in younger children, especially um, diabetic children or pre-diabetic children um, that are very obese and overweight. Um, and the treatment for that is the same as an adult, just a CPAP. Uh, some kids, though, snore and it's related to allergies. And that's because that whatever they're allergic to causes swelling in the larynx and the tongue and the epiglottis. And so it can be allergy related. And then, of course, sudden infant death syndrome is something that we would um, want to um, to prevent. So the teaching on that is, as you know, back to sleep. The child needs to have um, a firm mattress inside their crib, no blankets, um, no pillows, no excessive uh, toys or teddy bears or anything they can choke on inside the crib. And uh, that's for up to a year after birth. After that, they no longer have to go on their back to sleep. They can change positions because they're old enough to roll themselves over if they're in a position of not being able to breathe at that point. Another thing we see very commonly in our pediatric patients is something called croup. Croup is, um, the long name for it is laryngeotracheobronchitis. Um, but epiglottitis also falls under this and bacterial tracheitis. So basically these are caused by um, swelling in the back of the throat and in the trachea, um, possibly the glottis. Epiglottitis is the most life-threatening of these. So if it's just a, a regular croup, they tend to cough a lot you know, it's continual. Um, and it's generally more annoying than anything because it just doesn't go away quickly. It, it kind of tends to linger. But epiglottitis is more severe because the, the throat, the, the, the superglottis is so narrow that they can barely get a breath in. And if it closes, you can't intubate past that. So we would want to intubate before that happened. And so if you um, have a child that comes in and has that um, frog-like sound uh, where they're gasping for breath, trying to get a breath in, um, make sure that you uh, know what to do in this emergency case. So um, you would need to bring over a crash cart because there may suddenly be a need to intubate the child. Um, you don't leave that child alone so you need to call help because you can't leave the room. They often uh, present with drooling, agitation, and in a tripod position. Um, there's inspiratory stridor, uh, frog-like sound, high fever, and severe retractions. So generally, this patient is going to get so tired from trying to breathe that they'll eventually have respiratory failure or their throat will just close up. Uh, and so they should be moving pretty rapidly, this child, towards innovation. This is what tripoding will look like in a child this age. And it's kind of weird. You've probably seen adults do this a lot and you don't think much of it. But when you see a child do it, uh, something inside your head should go, oh, no, that's not right. That needs to be fixed. So, um, the, again, this is the picture of the size of the child's trachea, and you can see right here, the cricoid cartilage right here is generally right below that is where we would uh, do a tracheostomy. So, um, but you can see right there that if it's swollen shut, they can't do a tracheostomy. So that's another reason that this is so dangerous because um, it, it may not, you may not be able to establish an airway even with a tracheostomy if this closes completely. Lower airway disorders that um, we have in this chapter are influenza A and B, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, which is also called RSV, 
Um, we have uh, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and streptococcal pharyngitis. So these are all lower airway disorders. Um, so uh, RSV is particularly common in the hospital. There's certain times of the year where we go in there to do rotations on the peds floor. And I'd say, you know, if there's 20 patients on the floor, 18 of them have RSV. So it's very seasonal. And, um, and common enough to, that most of the unit is filled with patients that have RSV. It's most common among children that are less than five, and that doesn't mean that older kids don't get it, but when older kids get it, their airways are bigger, and it just looks like a regular cold, and so it's not as severe. The reason it's more common to be hospitalized in kids under five is because um, the airway is smaller and so it affects them more. Um, they, when they're sick like that, they can't eat, especially if their nasal um, uh, nasal passageway is clogged with uh, mucus and, and they're a baby. The baby can't breathe. They, uh, babies are obligate nose breathers. And so if they can't breathe through the nose, they can't feed because you blo the baby blocks the nose when they're feeding generally. Um, so other risk factors so uh, can be related to the anatomy, um, a compromised immune system, anemia can make this problem worse because they're already having problems oxygenating. Allergies and secondhand smoke both make these problems worse. And um, kids that, um, tend to have these rapid, the, these frequent illnesses uh, of the upper respiratory or lower respiratory system often have parents that smoke. And so that would be an important teaching to um, do with the parents to let them know that, um, that this is affecting the health of the child. Anything that says strep uh, has to be uh, followed up on. Um, so strep throat often can't, the strep can travel to other places in the bodies and you'll learn about that when we get to uh, say the, uh, the kid urinary system. Um, there's different kinds of secondary infections that can occur when a child's had strep. So um, we'll focus on those in another chapter. So acute care in the child that comes to you with a respiratory problem, you're going to watch for signs and symptoms of respiratory distress and be ready to initiate um, initiate a rapid response if necessary. Be ready to um, have the child intubated if necessary. Um, always when you're giving treatments, uh, say breathing treatments, you're going to want to assess them before and after the treatment so that you can tell the difference if they're improved or not. Um, common nursing diagnoses for um, children uh, that have acute respiratory problems are ineffective breathing pattern, um, imbalanced nutrition uh, and fluid. This is because infants, especially, they, they often don't eat or drink when they are um, in respiratory distress. And, and especially if they're breathing more than 70 respirations a minute, they're supposed to be MPO anyways because of the risk for aspiration. It's very difficult to coordinate your breathing um, if you're a baby with uh, swallowing at that rapid of a rate. And um, anxiety is another big problem. Um, parents are, and the child themselves um, will be fearful in, in the case of respiratory distress. It's very, very fear producing for both of them. So your job will be to be a calm, steady presence, but also ready to intervene as needed. Um, nursing interventions uh, that you'll see, every kid that is admitted to the hospital uh, with a respiratory problem is going to be on a continuous pulse ox. So you want to make sure that it's in an appropriate position and that it's applied correctly. And also make sure that you change the probe site every four to eight hours because worst case scenario, and I have seen this happen, it happened to my sister when she was in the hospital. They left the probe on so long in one spot and never moved it, they degloved her finger. So you, you do need to know that um, it's very important to change the probe site and any place else where there's tape or, um, you know, some, something 
putting pressure on the skin. Uh, watch for positioning. Um, as, as I've said before, uh, positioning is very important with oxygenation. So semi-fowlers is the best for the child when they're awake. And then their neck should be extended with a neck pillow. So that keeps their chin from going down to the chest and blocking their airway. Especially That's especially important with smaller children. Be ready to troubleshoot any abnormal findings. Um, so if you have a pulse ox that's 89, I don't necessarily need to call it a rapid response over that. I need to check the probe and make sure that it's positioned right. Well, especially with smaller children, often they kick their feet and it dislodges the probe just enough to give a faulty reading. So I'm going to troubleshoot those findings and then I will report it if it continue, continues to be abnormal. Um, always assess the oxygen flow rate. Um, you know, lots of times kids are taken out for a chest x-ray and then they're brought back and the oxygen's not attached to the wall or someone has turned it off. Also, kids, um, they need humidified air. Uh, humi humidification is very important, um, especially with respiratory problems, to keep the, um, the mucous membranes from getting dry and cracked and bleeding. Uh, use the lowest oxygen rate possible to prevent dependence on that oxygen. Never silence the alarms on the machines and <clears throat> never leave the, the room if the child's having severe respiratory distress. You'll just call for help and um, get help to come to you. Other problems that you'll see involving the respiratory system uh, include uh, tonsillitis or adenoiditis. Uh, so the tonsils often get um, swollen and enlarged in kids, but there's other adenoids in the area that can also become enlarged. So uh, they're part of the lymphatic system and the job of the adenoids and the tonsils are to, um, to for the body to be able to detect illnesses that you're being exposed to and bacteria, and then um, make antibodies for those. But if they get too enlarged, as they sometimes do, they can cut off the airway. And so um, although we try not to remove the tonsils unless we have to, if they're encroaching on the airway, they have to be removed. Uh, one thing to know about tonsils, though, is they are highly vascularized. That means there's a lot of blood pressure from the carotid artery near those tonsils. And so if it bleeds, it will bleed a lot. Um, so um, manifestations of tonsillitis are sore throat, difficulty swallowing or eating, history of otitis media. So um, a lot of times the sore throat is connected to, uh, you know, an infection through the eustachian tube. Um, they're very close to each other and can cross contaminate. Um, but with tonsillitis, you'll also have a, a mouth odor from the infection on the tonsils. They'll have bad breath. Um, they'll be mouth breathing. Often they can't breathe through the nose because it's too inflamed. When they sleep, they'll be snoring. Their voice will sound nasally because of the inflammation in the nose and it, often they have a high fever. All right, and so nursing care related to tonsillitis, it's important that they get their antibiotics to kill any bacteria, antipyretics to bring their fever down. Obviously, they're going to be in pain, and so hydrocodone is um, usually a pain relief of choice in these cases. And then gargling with salt water and rest. So salt water helps draw out some of the edema in the inflamed tissues. Um, and then at, if they have had a tonsillectomy. The postpartum, the post tonsillectomy care um, is to watch for frequent swallowing in case they're swallowing blood. Um, they can, there's enough blood that can come out from those tonsils that they could potentially bleed a significant amount into their stomach, even to be enough to be life threatening. So if they're swallowing during their sleep, you want to check that out. Also, if they vomit blood, that's also a sign that needs to be reported to the physician immediately. Um, 
And if they were bleeding into their stomach, of course, I would check vital signs immediately because signs of a hemorrhage are tachycardia and hypotension. Uh, look for pallor and that would be a sign of a loss of blood also. Um, you can apply ice to the throat to try to help reduce some of that swelling. Um, you don't want to feed kids with this uh, red um, liquids or pudding uh, jellos. You don't want them to suction in their mouth. You don't want them to use straws um, or do anything that could reopen those incisions. Um, also, you, they may want to avoid a coughing, uh, blowing their nose, or anything else that could open those uh, right after surgery. Um, and then no, as far as food choices, nothing citrusy should be on their tray because that's going to hurt. If you have an open wound in your throat and put lemon on it, you can imagine that sounds that would be terrible. So students miss that a lot on the test um, because they don't think about, about what that would feel like. Now going back to the use of the inhaler uh, or nebulizer, you want to be familiar with it. Um, so I know you may have to review from farm or fundamentals, um, but some quick reminders, you always assess the lung sounds before you administer um, any uh, inhaler. You always uh, want to space out the puffs by at least uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so if they have two puffs, you don't just give two puffs in rapid, uh, rapidly. You wait 10, 5, 10 to 15 minutes in between, and that's because the first dose needs time to open the airways, then the second dose will get in there deeper because the airways are open. Um, you want to determine the right size mask to use for a pediatric patient. And if RT is doing it, then you want to document every time they come. And you're responsible for notifying them if, say, they're running late. You're responsible to call them and find out you know, if they're going to come. Um, it has occurred before that sometimes respiratory, um, you know, thinks that somebody else has been there and they don't come. And if the child becomes, uh, gets in respiratory distress because of that, then as the nurse, you're going to be held responsible for why didn't you call them and, and ask them when they were coming. So, um, so that's an important thing for you to know. Also, um, review all the teachings for spacer use, asthma action plan, and uh, prevention, prevention of the oral fungus that can grow, the candida, in the mouth after using a inhaler that has steroids in it. Also, um, you should know about postural drainage and chest PT, chest percussion. You should know what that is and how it's done and when it's done for um, patients with uh, mucus production. Now, with any of these uh, different kinds of conditions, um, children can become hypoxic and um, have hypoxemia. So uh, early signs, again, are tachy tachypnea, tachycardia, restlessness, pallor of the skin and mucous membranes, nasal flaring, retractions, and tra uh, retractions here are called, right here, are called tracheal tugging. You'll hear that a lot. Late manifestations, so it's significantly advanced and nobody's intervened. Then you'll see confusion or stupor, cyanosis of the skin and mucous membranes, Br Brady, bradypnea or bradycardia, and then hypotension um, or hypertension, either one. So you'll see that um, in early stages, we have tachypnea. In, in more advanced stages, we have bradypnea because the, the muscles, the um, cardiac muscles, can't run forever trying to compensate. So when the child is unable to compensate, they will go down. The same for the heart. Tachypnea goes to bradycardia. So make sure that you're aware early versus late because that's very easy to miss on the test. All right, so for ongoing care, nursing care in the hospital, you're always going to be monitoring the child's temperature. 
If the child um, has been hypoxic or if you've suspected that they've had hypoxia, uh, often you'll want to ask or the doctor will order an ABG. Um, the ABG will tell you if the child's um, been hypoxic and what their pH balance is, so that's very important. If they're on a ventilator, oral care is very important. Um, if they're not on a ventilator, um, we're going to want to teach the child how to do incentive spirometry. Um, and you, as you probably already know with kids, we do alternate things sometimes. So instead of an incentive spirometer, we'll have them blow bubbles or blow a pinwheel or sometimes a ping pong ball. We'll have them try to blow that off the table. Um, it's more fun for them than using the incentive spirometer. Emotional support is very important. Suction, if appropriate, um, assessing fluid status, um, assessing the ABCs, nutritional status, skin, as you know, when you're not oxygenating well, you're at higher risk for having skin breakdown, for example. Um, discontinue oxygen gradually. Um, so generally, we don't just turn it uh, straight off. When the doctor wants us to stop using oxygen, we'll wean them off slowly over several hours. Um, also, it's important that the parents know that you can't smoke in the room when there's um, oxygen. Uh, they're not supposed to smoke in the room anyways. Um, and then we want to pr prevent oxygen toxicity, um, which you should already know what the, that is with adults, but kids are um, at risk for it also. And so what that looks like is a non-productive cough, substernal pain, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, headaches, and hypoventilation. Chronic lung diseases um, in adult populations are almost always related to smoking. In kids, um, not necessarily. So asthma um, is a chronic problem for kids. Some kids outgrow asthma, but a lot of kids have it as an ongoing problem for the rest of their lives. And so generally it's characterized by they have acute episodes or it can be exercise induced or it can be related to allergy seasons. Um, but generally they have well periods and then they have periods of exacerbation. Status asthmaticus is a medical emergency and it's another one of those where you never leave the child alone if they're having that. Um, and generally the way we tell if they're having status asthmaticus is they have wheezing in the lungs, but it goes from wheezing to no air movement. So you go to listen to the lungs and there's just no air movement. That's very ominous because it's down deep and there's no way to intubate them when there's no air movement down that deep. Um, other signs of this are um, JVD, diaphoresis, tachycardia, um, tachypnea, hypoxia, and risk they're at risk for cardiac arrest. Um, so you know that if, they're, if their lungs shut down, they'll stop breathing, but also it won't be long till their heart stops as well. Um, you're going to want to prepare to intubate this child. Um, hopefully it, you're able to get some air in, so definitely we want to intubate them before they've had status asthmaticus. <clears throat> we also are going to probably need ABGs to assess if they're um, if they have um, respiratory acidosis, and we're going to be giving emergency medications like epinephrine. If it's very mild, you can get away usually with treating with um, Benadryl. That's mild cases, though. Um, in more severe cases, they will need epinephrine. Um, chronic uh, bronco pulmonary dysplasia, also, it's also called chronic lung disease. This is a disease that generally occurs um, in kids that have been premature because when you've been ventilated on a, on a, uh, a ventilator, uh, there's scar tissue that forms in the lungs and that scar tissue makes the lungs less compliant. In other words, it don't, they don't stretch as well. And so those kids are um, at high risk for having future problems related to this bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, they get sick easier and more frequently. Um, and because of that scar tissue, they have um, 
a longer recovery from most respiratory illnesses. Um, and then cystic fibrosis. So um, we've talked a lot about cystic fibrosis in a previous class, but um, the main things to know, like I've, I've said before, uh, first of all, you should know that it's genetic. You should know that um, cystic fibrosis affects all the, all the whole body, any cell that makes mucus. Um, uh, primarily, the symptoms that we think about are in the lungs, but also <clears throat> the GI and the um, and the uh, reproductive system are also affected. Um, all, a lot of the symptoms are very much like what you would see with an adult COPD patient. Um, they can develop a barrel chest, clubbed fingers, um, and they just have uh, they have scarring in the lungs um, and a decreased uh, oxygen um, it, uh, exchange that occurs because of the scarring. Um, nursing diagnoses: we would have readiness for enhanced family coping an effective family therapeutic regimen or risk for situational low self-esteem. Um, children that have cystic fibrosis, it's very, because it's so deadly, um, they're at high risk for having depression um, related to it. Uh, a lot of the teenage patients in particular I've seen with cystic fibrosis have all been on antidepressants. Um, and then education, we're going to teach the family and the child about causes of the disease, coping, lifestyle changes, avoiding triggers. So as I mentioned before in a previous class, they can't have sleepovers with other kids. They can't be around um, pets or animals because they can get um, some of those rare bacterias that, that the animals have. Um, they need to learn how to manage their medications well, so they take vitamins. Um, they can't absorb fat-soluble vitamins, so they have to take all of those fat-soluble vitamins in a form where they're changed into being water-soluble. Um, and then they have to take pancreatic enzymes to help them absorb fat. Um, and then I, I mentioned that they have a newer medication that has caused a lot of children to go into remission with this. So that's <clears throat> pretty exciting, but it's very expensive. Teach the children how to cope with this long, this life-threatening, lifelong disease that they'll have, and also genetic counseling as they get older. Diagnostics for asthma. Uh, generally, Generally asthma, you hear wheezing, um, but occasionally you can get a little bit of hypoxia caused by mucus plugs or tra that traps air in there. And so whenever you have a mucus plug, you can have um, that alveoli burst and that causes scarring. So um, asthma pa patients um, often have some of that long-term damage to their lungs because of that kind of scarring. Um, the ultimate goal in nursing is to prevent those kind of episodes with the plugs, the mucus plugs, to prevent damage to the lungs. So diagnostics are going to be pulmonary function tests. They can also do x-rays to see if the child has uh, a lung collapse. They could have atelectasis related to um, the asthma. Um, and then also ABGs if they've had an acute episode. And then going back to cystic fibrosis, remember that it's um, a lifetime uh, disease. It's never going to be cured. Although if they do get a lung transplant, the lung generally no longer has the symptoms of cystic fibrosis because it, it doesn't have the same genetic material in it. So, um, but other than that, they would still have the uh, effects to their other organs. Um, mucus glands in, in this disease secrete too much mucus and the mucus is thick and sticky. So um, other organs that are involved that I haven't mentioned before are the pancreas, the liver, um, and of course the respiratory system. Um, it's higher risk in Caucasian families, um, so you should be aware of that. Um, and then the diagnostic test is a sweat chloride test. 
um, DNA test and pulmonary function and stool samples. So uh, stool samples, it would be a fat would be in the stool since they can't um, process fat you would see that on the stool because it would all come out and it would look white and frothy. Um, so findings at birth are a meconium ileus at birth. Um, so a lot of times this is diagnosed before the child even goes home from the hospital because they never pass a first stool. If they do, um, it can be frothy and greasy looking and possibly white. Um, Failure to thrive is often seen in kids that have cystic fibrosis. They often need feeding tubes. They need about double the amount of calories that a normal child would need because they're working so hard to breathe and that takes a lot of calories. Oftentimes they can't even get enough calories in their body and that's why they need a feeding tube at night while they're asleep to give them enough calories. Sometimes they have delayed growth um, because of their poor nutrition. They can have rectal prolapse because if they don't take their medications properly, it can cause um, severe um, constipation, which prolapses the rectum uh, if, it, if they're pushing hard enough. Um, they can have vitamin deficiencies um, and they can have reflux. Uh, gastric reflux. So those are the the findings with cystic fibrosis. Nursing uh, interventions. Of course, I said they need a high calorie diet. We don't usually restrict the amount of fat that they get because that is one way to get a lot of calories. Uh, chest percussion. Uh, so generally they have a vest that does chest percussion for them. Um, water soluble vitamins which are basically fat soluble vitamins that have been turned into water soluble vitamins, pancreatic enzymes, laxatives, supplemental feedings, possible lung transplantation. Um, and I think I covered this other uh, list of risk factors, but also consider that they're supposed to even avo avoid other kids with cystic fibrosis. So they used to have support groups for um, kids that had different kinds of illnesses. Um, this is a situation where if they had a support group, it would have to only be online virtually. Be and this is because if a, one child has a rare bacteria, they can easily spread it to another child that has um, no immunity from that. So they can also get um, sick with that same rare bacteria. So that's all I have. Um, thanks for watching uh, this. And I hope you do well on the test. Good luck.